everyone. Today Lord, we're in Lord. Titus chapter 2, and last week, as we saw, even though all of us are required and responsible as Christians to meet these qualifications and to live this way, chapter 1 was primarily concerned with the characteristics of church leaders, whereas chapter 2, as we're looking at today, is primarily concerned with the characteristics of church lay people. So chapter 1 was church leaders, chapter 2 is church lay people everyone else. Uh, but remember that Paul's main, one of Paul's main points at least, is, is just by saying that an elder or a pastor must be what all Christians should be. And so today we're looking at how Christian living should work itself out. And out of the, one of the, one of the key points that Paul lays out in chapter 2 is that true Christianity is a life of submission. The first 10 verses, really all the chapter, is all about submission. Submission to the word, submission to the church, church leaders, submission to marriage, Submission to parents, submission at work and in everyday life, and then submission to government. Most of those things are found within this chapter. All of those things are found within this book. And so that is one of Paul's main points that he's making also through the book of Titus. And so today, we're looking at godliness. And so we're going to see three things about godliness today in chapter 2. One, godliness is displayed through submission. That's chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Godliness is displayed through submission. Number two. Godliness is dependent upon salvation. That's chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. Godliness is dependent upon salvation. And finally, godliness is demanded by Scripture. That's the last verse. Godliness is demanded by Scripture. So let me pray, and then we will jump right into Titus chapter 2. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. And God, that we have this wonderful gift to be able to read from your word, to be able to know who you are and to be able to know how to respond and how to live. And Father, I pray that you would guide us as we go through this passage. God, that you would lead us, that you would teach us, and that you would continue to use your word to transform our hearts and our minds and our lives and to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus in every way. Because this passage, like every passage in the Bible, is all about him. And so God, make us be more like him. We love you and praise you, God. And we pray this all in the name. Amen. All right, Titus chapter 2 says this. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober minded, dignified, self controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, will be reverent and behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, pure working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for good, uh, for his own possession, or zealous for good works, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. Now, because of ungodly leadership, what we saw in chapter 1, because of ungodly leadership from the world, and even within the church in Crete, uh, there were still some problems that needed to be addressed, specifically with the people, with the church members. And like chapter 1, everything starts with leadership. The way that the leadership speak, the way that the leadership act, the rules that they regulate, all of those things trickle down to how the people respond, how the people act, what the people say, how the people respond and, and live their lives. And so he starts off right off the bat with Titus, verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now Paul began with Titus, and he basically said, show yourself to be different than all of the false teachers I just told you about in chapter 1. They keep teaching man's word. They keep teaching, teaching whatever they feel should be taught, but you are to teach God's word. Because only God's word can and will change lives. They are insubordinate to the scriptures. And they separate themselves from the scriptures. 
But you are to submit yourself to the scriptures. This is what Paul is telling Titus to do. Submit yourself to the scriptures. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. And this is what you are to teach. Verses six through uh, verses two through six. Older men are to be sober minded, dignified, self controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women likewise be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves so much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, this passage includes everyone. It includes older men, older women, younger women, and younger men. Thus, none of us can escape the Bible's jurisdiction over our lives. These five verses alone hold us all accountable to the Word of God. So the question we have to all ask ourselves is, is, is this your life? Is this my life? Is, is, do our lives match up with this text? Older men, is this your life? Older women, is this... Your life. And by the way, in order to pass these qualities down to the next generation, you have to possess these qualities. So is this your life? Younger women, same thing. Younger men, same thing. Is this your life? And if the answer is characteristically no, then what needs to change? You and I all have areas in our lives that, that need to change. We need God to continue conforming us into the image of Christ. Why? Because we still have the like, old nature that we're dragging along with us as Christians. So we, we still have problems, we still have issues, we still have things in our lives that need to be changed. But if the answer to that question before, is this your life, do we match up to this passage? If it's no, characteristically no, then, then there's something that needs to change and we must examine our own lives because as Christians, the answer should be characteristically yes. Now the Bible never says a Christian will be perfect. But it does say that a Christian will be different. And this is what Paul is saying here. There should be a clear distinction between what is Cretan and what is Christian. And the same is true for us today. You know, many people will, will take, take the Bible in and they'll say that it's really not relevant for today. But everything that Paul was saying back then in the first century is still happening today in the 21st century, 2,000 years later. We still have issues of lying, false teaching, greed, sexual immorality, arrogance, drunkenness, quick-temperedness, gluttony, insubordination, violence, role reversals, people professing to know God but denying Him by the works, and even the quote that Paul gave to Titus, uh, the quote that he, he quoted one of their prophets, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That sounds a lot like 2020. Why? Because even though the cultures have changed over time, the human heart is exactly the same. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. We need help as people. We need the Lord. So are you different from the world? Are we different from the world? If not, then the Bible calls us to examine our own lives. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul speaking to the Corinthians he, he said this, examine yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? There is an eternal difference between acknowledging facts and authentic faith. And this is why the call of Scripture is to repent and believe. We must believe the gospel message that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, rose again on the third day. We have to turn from our sins. We have to repent of our sins. We have to confess our sins and turn to Him. The Bible, all through the book of Acts, says repent and believe. And at least at the start, it is the duty of the pastor, the elder of the church, to not only teach all of these things that Paul just listed out, verses 2 through 6, uh, but to also model them as well. Model them in his own life and also model them in his home. Verse 7. Show yourself, in all respects, to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. And so a pastor's job is, is to teach the truth and also to live out the truth for all to see. Basically, their behavior must, must match their belief. And remember, this is, all, this is true for all of us in this room. We must live lives that are characterized by this passage. There should be no difference between your words and your ways. Our words and our ways, the things that we say and the things that we do, should be consistent with the lives that we are living. Why? 
the reason that Paul gives is so that an opponent will have no grounds to condemn you or to call you out for being inconsistent or for being a hypocrite. And the way we live is important because none of us are isolated islands. Paul even ended verse 8 by stating that these opponents then, as they looked at Titus, as they looked at the eldership, the leaders of the church on Crete, that they would have nothing evil to say about us. They would actually be ashamed. But notice that Paul did not say that they would have nothing evil to say about you, Titus. No, he said they would have nothing evil to say about us. That means that the way Titus lived back then represented not only himself, but also the Apostle Paul and his apostolic ministry, and ultimately the entire church. And the same is true for us today. Whether we like it or not, we are representatives. We represent God. We represent our families. We represent our workplaces. We represent our church. We represent uh, the global church. And people are looking at our lives. And there are two outward perceptions given in Scripture that as people look at our lives, these are two outward perceptions that we see in Scripture that they might come away with. Either people will look at your life, and as Titus 2, 7 through 8 says, they will be ashamed. They won't have anything evil to say about you. Or, as Romans 2, 24 says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, people will either look at your life and be further convicted of their sin, or they will look at your life and be further conformed to their sin. Now, what do I mean by that? What's an example? Um, think about if you're in a group and somebody says a very perverse joke. You're not so, as Christian, we should not laugh at those types of jokes. It's not funny, it's ungodly. And then the other person then will be left kind of awkward, uncomfortable, and that is the point. They should be uncomfortable. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if we do laugh, then we are further confirming for them that it's okay and it's not okay. And so we have to be careful at, at, at the way that we act, the things that we say. And so people will either look at your life and be further convicted of their sin, or they will look at your life and be further conformed to their sin. And we are to live lives characterized by godliness, even if we are in the worst situation imaginable. And that's when Paul goes into slavery. Even if we are in the worst situation imaginable in this life, we are to live lives characterized by godliness. Verse 9. Bond servants or slaves are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now Paul told slaves here to live in such a way that actually makes the gospel message attractive to their own masters. You're to submit to your own masters in everything. Now this is similar language to what we see early on in the chapter, but I just read over. Uh, in, in verse 3, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves so much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, it doesn't say that wives should submit to all men, it just says that they should submit to their own husbands. So, this right here, what Paul is saying, this has absolutely nothing to do with with what some have claimed to be sexual inferiority. It's slaves, masters, wives, husbands, they're all equal. Men and women are equals in the sight of God, neither is greater or lesser. And this is referring specifically to the operation of marital function. God has placed divine parameters on roles within the marriage union. And so when we get to this passage then, speaking of slaves, and masters, neither one is, is lesser in the sight of God. Both are equal as human beings. But Paul, speaking to a very corrupt society, is telling the church, you need to be different. Uh, everyone else is, is not submissive. They're all rebellious. They, they, they steal from their masters. They do this or that. They act a certain way. As Christians, we are to be different. We're to, be, we're to live lives characterized by godliness. So Paul told slaves to live in such ways that actually made the gospel message attractive to their own masters. And this type of submission was countercultural then, and it is still countercultural today. Why? Because we don't like to submit. That's something that we all struggle with naturally. And it's hard. It is hard. It is a hard thing to do for us to submit ourselves to someone who, in our mind, may not deserve me submitting to them. 
But again, we don't submit to people because of who they are. We submit to people and position because of who God is and what God has said. And so it was counterculture then, it's counterculture today because we don't like to submit, especially like slavery here, when our God-given natural human rights are violated. But this is what we have to remember. True Christianity is a life of submission. And the refusal to submit to any God-ordained authority structure is un. Godly, And one of the reasons why we in our culture specifically today hate the word submit is because our culture lies to us and says that submission is weakness or passive. But godly submission, as we look throughout the scriptures, is the furthest thing from weakness. It is strength. And we can see that all over our culture today. They can't control themselves. They, they, can't, they can't submit. They, they refuse to submit. Whereas as a church... We have the Spirit of God, the power of God, to submit ourselves, because ultimately our submission is, is not necessarily to any government. It is to the highest government. It is to the highest order. It is to God himself. And so the proof of this is, is seen all over today. And this is hard for us. I mean, how many of our kids rebel over and over again? That is a refusal to submit to the parental structure. How many of our marriages are at odds because all we want is our own way? That is a refusal to submit to the marital structure. And how many of adults in our country refuse to comply with, with certain government orders and policies specifically going on today? That is a refusal to submit to the governmental structure. Godliness is displayed through submission. That is our first point. Godliness is displayed through submission. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, why does our pastor keep talking about submission over and over again? It feels kind of like a week-by-week -week basis. And, my answer really to that is twofold. First, I will always endeavor to teach what is in the passage. Just let the passage speak for itself. I try every week to just remove Cameron and just let the word of God speak. So this passage, the fact that we are in Titus today, if we were in Esther, now we're in Titus, and then after this we're going to be in Galatians, this was chosen way before COVID-19. This was chosen earlier last year. So I, I want you to see, though, that I'm, I'm not making this up. This chapter, in this chapter, we see that the church is to submit to the word of God. And as for you, verse 1, teach what it forms with sound doctrine. Where do you get that sound doctrine? You get it from the word of God. All through chapter 1, Paul talked about false teachers who were insubordinate to the scriptures. They were unwilling to submit themselves to the word of God. Paul is telling Titus to submit himself to the word of God, to the truth. You submit to the scriptures. So we see the church is to submit to the word of God. Women are to submit to their husbands, their own husbands, just the marital function. Younger people are to submit to the instruction of the older and more mature believers. And slaves are to submit to their own masters. And even, as we'll see in verse 11, Jesus submitted himself to the plan of the Father. That is what we see all throughout this chapter. Submission is everywhere in Titus chapter 2. The second reason why... It just feels like we're kind of, we've talked about this over the last few weeks. It's because it is my job. And I say that because Titus chapter 3 verse 1, uh, Chris will be teaching on this next week, but Titus chapter 3 verse 1 says this, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. One of the divine job descriptions given to every pastor is to remind God's people to be submissive citizens living in a rebellious world. Why? So that people, as Paul says, so that people will see the difference in the way we live and potentially be led to salvation. That we practice what we preach. That our lives match this text. That what we say, that our behavior matches what we believe. And this leads us into verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Godliness is displayed through submission, and godliness is dependent upon salvation. Now, within this this section right here, we see God's threefold plan of salvation. Verse 11 is the past, uh, verse 12 is the present, and verse 13 is the future. So verse 11 is justification. 
we have been justified because Jesus came into this world. He submitted to the plan of the Father that he had made from before the foundation of the world. Jesus became a man, came into this world, and even submitted himself to the death on the cross for our sins. And he rose again. And because of that, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. When we believe in Christ and what he's done and that his sacrifice is enough to pay the debt that we owe, we are justified. We see that in Romans chapter 5. We are justified, which means declared righteous. That is the first phase of salvation, justification. Verse 12 is the present reality. As we see in verse 12, it's training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. This is what's happening now. This is the present tense. We are being trained. That is sanctification. We are free. We are saved. As Christians, saved from the power of sin. So justification is saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is saved from the power of sin. And the final one is when Jesus comes back, we're waiting for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes back, that will be our glorification as believers. And that is when we will be saved from even the presence of sin. So we have a past, present, future, all forms of salvation, God's threefold plan of salvation. Because of this section, it's all about being saved. Godliness is dependent upon salvation. Now, unbelievers, non-Christians, are not godly. They, they may have learned a few good morals by growing up in either a family or society that has at some point been influenced by the gospel, but they themselves are not and cannot be godly. However, for us who are Christians, we have been saved, and God's grace is actually training us to be godly. But why do we need to be trained? And the answer to that is because this is not natural. Godliness is not natural. It's the same with, with verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not senders or slaves too much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own Husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. We all need to be trained, all of us, because it's not natural. These qualities are not natural. And specifically with love, going back up to, to verse 4 and 5 there, specifically with love, the Bible does not support the falling in love concept that our culture has come up with. The falling in love concept, our culture says that if you can fall in love, you can obviously fall out of love. The Bible does not teach that or support that. Instead, the Bible teaches us that we must be discipled and trained, and we must learn to love. We must learn to love our husbands and children. We must learn to love our wives. We must learn to love people around us. Genesis 24, 67 uh, says this, Then Isaac took her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Now I want you to notice the order. They got married, and then he loved her. That is the order of this. It wasn't, I fell in love, got married. Isaac learned to love Rebecca over time. That is what the Bible teaches. We must be trained as disciples. We must be trained in godliness. Why do we need to be trained? Because godliness is not natural. It's something we have to learn. And one of the reasons we are called to live godly lives is because Jesus is coming back. Verse 13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's two things I want to point out here in this verse, verse 13. This first is a clear description of the deity of Christ. Now, there is some debate on whether or not there should be a comma after the great God. So basically it would be read, the appearing of the glory of our great God, meaning the Father and Savior, Jesus Christ. So some people debate that and think that we're talking about the two different persons of the Trinity here. But um, in Greek, there's a, there's a few things I could talk about, I'm not going to, but I think the overall point here is how do we know that this is referring to Jesus as both God and Savior? And the reason why we know that is because we are not waiting for the appearing of the Father. We are waiting for the appearing of the Son. Thus, Jesus, Paul labeled Jesus as both God and Savior in this passage. And number two, Christ came the first time in grace. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, past the end. He brought salvation for all people. Salvation is not offered to all people. Christ came the first time in grace, but he is coming the next time in full glory as king. This is what Hebrews 9, 28 says. So Christ, 
having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. He is coming back a second time. That's what we're waiting for. Not to deal with sin, though, but he's coming in glory. And he's not coming to take sides. He's coming to take over by setting up his own kingdom and his own people that he, verse 14, gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus did not just save us from some forms of lawlessness. He saved us from all lawlessness, which tells us that lawlessness actually enslaves us. Sin enslaves us. It keeps us in bondage. But Jesus came to free us from that. So notice that we are not saved from good works, but we are saved for good works. This section right here begins with the grace of God appearing, bringing salvation to all people. It begins with God and salvation. And it ends with good works. And that's always the order. We do not work for our salvation. We work from our salvation. We are not saved from good works. We are saved for good works. Again, just like uh, I think it was 1 Timothy 1.9 or 2 Timothy 1.9, whatever passage I, I gave you last week. We are saved to do something. We are saved to serve. We are saved and called to a holy calling. So godliness is displayed through submission, and godliness is dependent upon salvation, and godliness is demanded by Scripture. Verse 15, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. Now Paul basically told Titus to declare and proclaim all of these things, everything that I've already said, I want you to teach these things, and to exhort, which means to strongly encourage and even urge someone, and also to rebuke with all authority, so exhort and rebuke with all authority. And he ended by telling Titus not let anyone disregard him. Basically, the, the pastor of any church should teach in such a way as to leave no rock unturned and to allow no one the opportunity to escape the divine correction of the Word of God. Why? Because we all have areas in our lives that need to be corrected. And so there is a personal response that every one of us must make when it comes to the gospel. But what is what is the authority that Paul's talking about? It's just Titus the authority that you have, or the apostolic authority that I have, well, it can't be Paul because no one else has his authority. He was an apostle. No one else is an apostle. It can't be Titus. The authority that we're talking about is the Word of God. Again, going back to the Scriptures, as we see in chapter 1, chapter 2, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Always go back to the Scriptures. That is our authority. And the authority comes from the Lord Jesus. In Matthew 28, 18-20, this is what Jesus said. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we preach the word of God based upon the sovereign authority of God himself. Jesus has given the authority of his word to his church throughout the ages. So godliness is demanded by Scripture, And this is kind of a big idea. This is the point of, of Titus chapter 2. Godliness is demonstrated and seen. Godliness is demonstrated and seen. For us as Christians, if we are true Christians, if godliness will be demonstrated in our own lives. And it will be a public thing. People will see it. And this is how Jesus exemplified, exemplified godliness. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically, even though he is God, he submitted himself to an oppressive government and died an unjust death because far above Israel and far above Rome, he submitted himself to the Father. Godliness is demonstrated and seen. God will never call us to something that he himself is unwilling to do. Thus, he showed us that true Christianity is a life of submission. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God chose his love for us, and in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if, if, if you have not believed, and you know that you are not saved at this moment, then this is your moment. If you have not believed the gospel message that, that salvation has come, that salvation has appeared, Jesus has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, offering salvation to all people. If, if you have not 
place your faith in Christ. This is your moment. Jesus submitted his life so that you and I would be saved. Now the opportunity is for us to submit our lives to him, that we would be saved. And so as I pray, I want us to, actually, I just want us to take a moment of silence, and then I'll give us a prayer. But just, just speak to the Lord. Just talk to him. If you're a believer, obviously, I mean, he's your father. Talk to him because you love him. And thank him. And thank him for salvation. Thank him for the gift of his grace. But if you're not a believer, just, this is the time. Allow the Holy Spirit to, have, to do His work in your life, to save you from your sins, that you do not have to face the wrath of God on your own. That can be applied to the blood of Christ. And so take this moment of silence, and I will call you to sing. For us who know you, we know you. And that is an amazing fact. It's an amazing truth. We don't deserve to know you. We don't deserve your love. We don't deserve your grace. We, that's grace. It's undeserved. You give it to us anyway. And so, God, we thank you so much for, for being willing. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being willing to submit yourself to the Father's plan. We thank you for for becoming a man, limiting yourself in, in, in certain ways, and even dying on the cross for our sins, rising in for, for us, that we would be saved, that we would be able to know you and experience true life with you. God, we thank you for, for always pursuing us. God, never giving up on us. God, you love mankind. You love men, women, you love children, and you love everyone in this world, and your desire as we see from the past world, is just that you desire all people to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. You desire people to be saved from their sin. Because all sin does is separate us. All sin does is lead us to death. God, you came, Lord Jesus, you came to give us life and to give it abundantly. And so as, as, as Christians here, just continue to remind us of the gospel. And continue to excite us and fill us with increasing joy. Look, if there's anybody here who's, who's not saved, who's not a Christian, God, if this would be the moment that they would not let the past, that this would be the moment when, whether physically or, or, or mentally in their hearts, God, I just pray that they would fall on their knees before you and cry out to you. And they would recognize the sin they have in their own life. That if they're unsaved, obviously they haven't been living according to this passage. They can't experience true life, true godliness, apart from you. And they're also listening to your Jesus, you died for our sins, personal sins that we commit almost every single day. You died for us. In order that we might be saved. Three days later, you rose from the grave. You defeated sin. You defeated Satan. And you defeated death. You did it with no problem. Now there's nothing preventing us from being saved except us. And so I pray God that we just humble ourselves and submit ourselves to your word, to the authority of the scriptures that says. If you confess your sins and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that he died on the cross and, and rose again on the third day, you will be saved. And after all of us as a church, how do you would help us to live lives that are characterized by the gospel message? That we would never do anything. That we would strive to never, ever live in a way that could discredit the Christian message, that could that could bring a compromise on the witness of the church. Father, that we would live faithful and godly lives 
Lord, that you would teach us and remind us of the submission that, that, that you yourself have done. God, help us to be more and more like the Lord Jesus in every way. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to meet together as a body. And open up the scriptures that we have the freedom to speak out. And it's all because of your grace. So we praise you for that, God. That your grace is pure, bringing salvation to all people. God, train us to renounce ungodliness. To acknowledge evil, to say no, and to turn, and to live godly lives. As we wait for what we all want to happen. All of us as believers, that is, we all want the Lord Jesus to come back and rescue us from our own sins and from this world, from all corruption and all curse. But as we wait, teach us to be godly, mature, lovers of God, upright, holy, godly, and disciplined. Our lives are in your hands. We pray it's all in your name.